Hello everyone. Today we will discuss one of the commonest cause of the antepartum hemorrhage called placental abruption. It is also known as abruption placentae. It is defined as a premature separation of a normal implanted placenta from the uterine wall prior to the delivery of the fetus. So in this definition, normally implanted placenta means the placenta implanted in the wall of the fundus, the uterine fundus. So if when the placenta previa, in case of placenta previa, even though there is a separation of the placenta, we don't call it abruption. So the separation of the placenta can be partial or complete. In case of complete separation, there is a complete detachment of the placenta from the uterine wall. In this case, the maternal and fetal sequelae is higher. The partial separation causes later maternal and fetal sequelae compared with the complete separation. Abruptual placenta is responsible for one third of antepartum hemorrhage. This incidence is one in 100 deliveries on average. It ranges from one in 80 to one in 250 deliveries. The variation in incidence is due to the different criteria were used for the diagnosis, as well as an increased detection of a lesser degree of placenta abruption in the recent years. These peak in the third trimester of pregnancy. Bleeding in placental abruption is primarily maternal in origin, but there may be a fatal bleeding in case of, especially during traumatic abruption due to the, the concomitant placental tearing. The bleeding can be revealed or concealed or mixed one. When we say revealed, as you see in the second picture, after the separation of the placenta, the bleeding is coming out through the cervical canal to become an external hemorrhage. But in case of concealed hemorrhage, the bleeding is retained be between the separated part of the placenta and the uterine wall, and also it, it can be they tend between the disuda and the membrane so that there is no revealed bleeding. It, is, it causes a delay in the diagnosis so that it is associated with a poor maternal and fetal outcomes. Concealed hemorrhage also increased, significantly increased the risk of consumptive coagulopathy because of the intrauterine pressure will push the thrombo, the produced thromboplastin to the large vein draining the placental implantation site. Concealed hemorrhage is relatively rare. It occurs in 10 to 20% of abruption. The other is the mixed one. When the above two occur together, we call it as mixed. It is also relatively common. The exact cause of placental abruption is not known, but there are several risk factors that increased the risk of placental abruption. Let us see one by one. Increasing parity. The risk of placental abruption increased with increasing parity. Studies found that the placental abruption, the risk is less than 1% in primi gravida. It reached to 2.5% in grand multiparous women. Advanced maternal age also increased the risk of placental abruption. But there are studies that found that if parity and hypertension is controlled, Advanced maternal age has no significant impact on the abruption placenta. Prior, previous history of abruption is the strongest risk factor for placental abruption. A woman whose previous pregnancy is complicated by abruption placenta, the risk of recurrence is 5 to 15%. If a woman had two previous pregnancies complicated by abruption placenta, the risk of recurrence is 20 to 25%. Abruption severe enough to cause stillbirth has also high chance of recurrence, estimated to be 7 to 11 percent. If abruption severe enough complicated two prior pregnancies, the risk of recurrence is 15 times higher. Cigarette smoking compared with the non-smoker, a pregnant woman who smokes cigarette have 2.5 fold increased risk of abruption severe enough to cause fatal death. It appears to be a dose response relationship. Uh, the risk of fatal death due to placental abruption is increased by 40% with each pack of cigarettes smoked. Cocaine abuse in the third trimester of pregnancy increased the risk of abruption by 10%. The other strongest risk factor is also trauma. 
expose blunt or penetrating trauma to the gravid abdomen increase the risk of placental abruption. With mild abdominal trauma, the risk of placental abruption is 7 to 9%. Severe abdominal trauma, the risk of placental abruption is 13%. So, <clears throat> the two commonest causes of trauma in pregnant women is motor vehicle crash and domestic abuse. In case of motor vehicle crash, the mechanism of abruption is direct penetration, placental shearing, and stretching force are the reason for placental abruption. Placental abruption commonly occurred within 24 hours of precipitating events. So after a woman sustained a trauma, you need to wait for 24 hours to rule out placental abruption. Compared with the non-traumatic abruption, the traumatic abruption, the risk of fatal bleeding is higher because of concomitant placental tearing. The other is maternal disease, hypertensive, Disorders increase the risk of placental abruption by fivefold. Both chronic and pregnancy-induced hypertension increase the risk of placental abruption. So the severity of hypertension doesn't always predict the risk of placental abruption. And also in a woman with chronic hypertension, giving antihypertensive medication and controlling the blood pressure doesn't decrease the risk of placental abruption. But studies found that a preeclamptic woman who received magnesium sulfate the risk of abruption decreased. Hypertension is found to be strongly associated with the severe form of abruption. Studies found that 40 to 50 percent of a woman, a pregnant woman who had abruption severe enough to cause fatal death has underlying hypertension. The other medical disorders are maternal hypothyroidism and asthma will also increase the risk of placental abruption. Preterm prom Increase the risk of abruption. Studies found that abruption occurred in 2 to 5 percent of a woman with preterm prom. Whether abruption is a cause or the consequence of preterm prom is not known. Studies found that the thrombin that was produced because of this decidual bleeding will cause membrane weakening that results in rupture of membrane. At the same time, rupture of membrane, especially with, with delayed latency period, there is a protest and cytokines are produced that cause disruption of the desudal vessels leading to hemorrhage. The risk of abruption is higher in a woman having prom with oligohydraminous and intraminotic infections. Rapid uterine decompressions associated with multifatal gestation and polyhydraminous also increase the risk of abruption placenta. Compared with the singleton, twins have three times high risk of placental abruption. The commonest time for abruption in tumor pregnancy is after delivery of the first tumor. Polyhydraminas also increase the risk of placental abruption because of rapid aminotic fluid passage that cause decompression of the uterus. So that when, when you do artificial rupture of membrane in a woman having polyhydraminas controlled, the, the aminosynthesis is recommended. Con, I mean controlled aminotomy is recommended. Uterine factors. Uterine Anomalies in triuterine, thenicus, and the scar will increase the risk of placental abruption because of suboptimal placental implantation site. Thrombophilias, isolated single umbilical arteries are also the other risk factors that increase the risk of placental abruption. So let us see the pathogenesis. So as we have said before, the bleeding in placental abruption is primarily maternal in origin. So, there is a defective maternal vessels in the tissue basalis will rupture and cause the bleeding. So this bleeding will result in the decidual hematoma. The effect of the decidual hematoma it causes further placental separation, destruction and the compression of the adjacent placental tissue, loss of maternal and fetal surface area for nutrient and oxygen exchange. So with the decidual bleeding, there is also the production of thrombin, which plays an important role for the pathogenesis of placental abruption. Thrombin is produced by two pathways. With the decidual bleeding, there is a release of tissue factor that stimulates prothrombin to thrombin production along with activated factor, with activated factor 7. The other pathway is due to this decidual hemorrhage, there is hypoxia. This hypoxia stimulates the production of 
vascular endothelial growth factor that causes the expression of tissue factors leading to thrombin production. Thrombin has several effects. One is it is a potent direct eutrotonic agent. It also causes functional progesterone withdrawal. So this uterine contraction results in further placental separation and bleeding. The other is thrombin upregulates the production of matrix, matrix metalloproteinase. It increases the production of cytokines and upregulates gene involved in apoptosis. This results in destructions of the decudal vessels, causing further bleeding. Thrombin also triggers coagul coagulopathy, leading to consumptive coagulopathy in case of abruption. The other thing is, I mean, in general, thrombin plays an important role for the cyclic events in the pathogenesis of placental abruption. So let us see the clinical manifestation. The clinical manifestation depends on the temporal nature of abruption, acute or chronic, or severity of abruption. When you say acute abruption, mostly results from high pressure arterial hemorrhage at the central part of the placenta, leading to the rapid development of the life-threatening clinical manifestations like vaginal bleeding, non-reassuring fetal arterial pattern, uterine taxistole, and even fetal death. So in general, vaginal bleeding is the commonest clinical manifestations. It occurs in 78% of the cases. It is mild or severe, but the amount of vaginal bleeding does not predict the extent of placental separation and impending fetal risk since concealed hemorrhage occurred in 10 to 20% of the cases. Rather, maternal hypotension and fetal arterial abnormalities predict the clinically significant placental abruption. The other is abdominal pain and uterine tenderness occurred in 66% of the cases. Uterine contractions are usually high frequency and low amplitude, but contraction typical of labor can also occur in case of abruption so that the progress of labor may be fast. Non-reassuring fetal arterial pattern occurred in 60% of the cases. The commonest pattern is late deceleration. It occurs due to three important factors. One is uterine tachycystole, second is maternal hypotension, and third is decreased placental surface area. With severe abruption, when we say severe, greater than 50% of placental sur surface area is separated. It causes acute DIC in the form of consumptive coagulopathy in the fetal days. It occurs in 40 to 50% of a woman with abruption in the fetal days, commonly occurs within eight hours of the placental separation. The preterm labor occurs in 10 to 20% of a woman with abruption. The other is a chronic abruption results from the low pressure venous hemorrhage in the peripheral part of the placenta, so that it has a gradual clinical manifestation. It is manifested with light intermittent vaginal bleeding, oligohydraminous intrauterine, growth restriction, preterm prom, as well as preterm labor. And in this chronic abruption, the, there is no uh, DIC. So the coagulation profile is normal most of the time. Placental examination after delivery revealed there is a circumferential depression on the maternal surface of the placenta, which is covered by dark clotted blood. As you see in this picture, so the, in the maternal surface of the placenta, there is a dark clotted blood with depression. <clears throat> this thing required uh, uh, several minutes to develop so that a recently separated placenta may not reveal this clinical manifestation. It, it may appear normal. So let us see the diagnosis. Placental abruption is primarily clinical diagnosis supported by the radio radiographic laboratory and the pathologic studies. With severe placental abruption, the diagnosis is generally obvious, but with lesser degree of placental abruption cannot always be recognized with certainty. It is more of the diagnosis by exclusion, since there is no laboratory and imaging modality that accurately diagnose the lesser degree of abruption. So if you take ultrasound, it has its own limitation. Since the fresh clot and the placenta has several imaging similarities in the characteristics, so it has limited role in the diagnosis. The other thing is the negative finding on ultrasound does not effectively rule out the presence of placental abruption. And the sensitivity of ultrasound for the diagnosis of placental abruption is only 24%. Plus, I mean, ultrasound can identify three predominant locations of placental abruption, like preplacental, subcoronic, and retroplacental. MRI has high sensitivity for the diagnosis of placental abruption. So if, if the information 
is helpful for the management of the patient, you can consider MRI. Laboratory tests, CBCU is platelet count, coagulation profile can be performed. So, so let us see the complication. Abruption can result in both maternal and fetal complications. So if you see the maternal complication, it can cause blood loss, consumptive coagulopathy, coagulary thrush. When we say coagulary thrush, it's also known as utroplacental apoplexy. It is extravasation of blood into the myometrium and the uterine serosa, most commonly recognized at the time of serum and deliveries. It causes significant uterine atony in the postpartum hemorrhage, commonly managed by Conventional utrotonic agent, strictome is reserved for non-responsive cases. End organ damage, AKI can occur in case of placental abruption, especially those concomitant placental abruption in the placenta previa because of DIC as well as hemorrhage. Serum delivery rate is high, disease also can occur rarely. Fatal complications, IUGR prematurity. So 40 to 60 percent of placental abruptions occurred before seven weeks of gestation, so prematurity is common, hypoxia, stillbirth. So when you see the management, the management of placental abruption depends on the severity, gestational age, and maternal and fetal status. So once the diagnosis of placental abruption is made, the following should be performed. So the woman should be admitted, baseline laboratory assessment should be made, resuscitation based on the hemodynamic status of the woman, blood products are, should be prepared, especially if the woman DIC is suspected, the only management is Blood products, fresh frozen plasma, platelets should be very important. Maternal and fetal surveillance is very important. We, ha we, we need to do ultrasound throughout the presence of placenta previa. Fetal weight estimation by physical profiles, very important. Decision on expectant versus expedient delivery should be made. Indication for immediate deliveries, if there is ongoing major blood loss, if there is a significant coagulopathy, non reassuring fetal status, Fetal congenital anomalies, and if gestational age is greater than or than six weeks, it's an indication for delivery. Some say it's greater than seven weeks. If there is no indication for expedient deliveries, non severe placental abruption, remote from term can be managed expectantly as inpatient, better in a tertiary hospital setup. At this time, we have to administer antenatal corticosteroid for fetal lung maturities. Gestational age is 24 to 34 weeks of gestation. Maternal and fetal surveillance is very important. RH immunoglobulin if the woman is RH negative. Iron supplementation as well as therapeutic is very important. So deliveries after seven weeks of gestation. The mode of delivery, vaginal delivery is generally preferable. Caesarean delivery if there is maternal and fetal decompensation. Otherwise it is reserved for obstetrics indications. Thank you for watching.